as we sing number 21, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrow cease. This music in the sinner's ears, this life and health. the power of cancelled sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood availed for me. Hear him, ye death, his praise ye dumb. Your loosened tongues employ. Ye blind, behold, your Savior come and leave for joy. My gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of my name. Please be seated. Children dismissed for Children's Church. And again, we'd like to welcome Dr. Ernest Schmidt with us this morning as he brings forth uh, the morning message. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Larry. It's good to be back. I did some checking in records, and it was exactly one year and 11 months ago. We were here on uh, November the 22nd of uh, 2015. And so we're back after a year and 11 months exactly. Glad to be with you, been looking forward to this time. Let me just not warn you, but prepare you. When the pastor comes back, he is gonna be so fired up. He's gonna be so excited about uh, Israel and seeing the lands of the Bible being where it took place. So it's, it's a great thing. I'm sure somebody said he could take 4,000 pictures with his camera. Now, he probably won't show all of those, but he'd like to. So you will have a great time. Be blessed as he comes back and talks about that. We say in Israel, you don't use PowerPoint, you just point and say that's where it took place. That's where the Lord worked. He'll be walking where Jesus walked. Uh, he'll be seeing the sites uh, where the Lord Jesus taught or what we've read about so many times in the Bible uh, uh, tells about. So let me just tell you in advance, you already know that he's going to be so excited. He and his wife are going to be so blessed to share with you. And uh, you'll just sense in his preaching, his teaching, uh, that uh, he was blessed and that he is going to be excited about what God has done. So pray for him. I know everybody, th when you go to Israel, uh, you know, aren't you afraid to be there? Well, not really. But by the way, if the rapture took place and you did get killed, no better place in Israel. Well, anyway, that's not it. When we would go to Egypt, people were like to get out of Egypt. When we came out of Jordan, they, would like to, they were glad to come out of Jordan. But when we came to Israel, everybody feels at home. You got people around you with the automatic rifles continually, but they're called Israelis, the Israeli army. And uh, I'm sure that Pastor may have a picture too of those individuals uh, there. In fact, every once in a while, you'll find American Jews. I remember uh, meeting at least one or two that went from the United States to join the Israeli army as Jewish people. And so pray for your pastor. They're in a great place. They're gonna be so charged up and I'm excited for them to be able to be there. And I know he'll probably come back and say, we gotta get a group from our church going. So you better start saving because he's gonna wanna go back again. Uh, it's like sort of like uh, Pringles or whatever they are. You can't eat just one. And going back to Israel, you don't want to go back just one time. So be praying for him, looking forward to what he has to share with you. Let's pray and then look at God's word together. Father, we are grateful for thy goodness, for thy blessings, for who you are. I pray that we will be challenged by your word, by your spirit, 
this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When we've gone to Israel and other places, I don't like to go alone. My wife goes. She hasn't been there all the time, my wife, Jen. And uh, we have uh, enjoyed traveling together. It's always great when I can have her along. I don't like to go places uh, alone. And so after 51 years, it just keeps getting better and better. And so I'm glad she's along with us. Now, other than Psalm 23, what is probably the most familiar verse in the Bible He said, I'm not going to answer because I know I'm going to be wrong. No, okay. Other than, I think I may have heard it. Other than Psalm 23, it's a New Testament verse. What would you say? In fact, if uh, once in a while, if you're still not disenchanted with the FNL, FNFL like I am, okay. At the end zone, you'll see somebody holding this up. What is that verse? John 3.16. You may want to turn there because we'll be there this morning in John chapter 3 and verse 16. It may be like this. Charles Spurgeon, you've probably heard of him, a great preacher of England in days gone by. One of my role models that I never met because he's dead. Died in 1892. But somebody said to him or passed a note to him, There's part of Rock of Ages, simply to thy cross I cling. Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. And some people say, you know... You say that too much. Well, maybe today we need to be reminded as preachers, you don't say that enough. And when it comes to John 3.16, sometimes we say, I would never look at John 3.16 as far as preaching it, because everybody knows it, right? And we do. But let me remind us of great truths from John chapter 3 and verse 16. I remember years ago reading a theological journal. I know that sounds dry, dead, dull, dusty. And you say, I don't want anything to do it, but I was challenged in the area of missions, and I want to share with you just a basic outline, and then I've uh, added to that, but I was so challenged, I read that a long time ago about missions, and we started off with a song about the whole world, and people from Africa, from Asia, in different places. So let's say it together. Now, I realize there are lots of versions, so we won't read it, okay, Uh, because it could be uh, challenging, and that's fine, but probably many of you have memorized this in the King James Version, And so let's say it together, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Some have said that's a gospel in a nutshell. And it is. And there's so much truth there. I think the first time I ever had anybody personally talk to me and explain the gospel because I asked, because my a Bible study had started. I had been reading books about the gospel or a particular book about the gospel. Anybody ever heard of Danny Orlis? Anybody ever heard? Yes, okay. That's a book written a long time ago. Bernard Palmer from Holdish, Nebraska. Used to go to the Angle Inlet up here in Minnesota, way up. You have to go through Canada to get there by land. And he would write books called Danny Orlis. And I picked up a Danny Orlis book. I didn't read it. My dad said, you ought to read this and be like this boy. That's the first time I heard the gospel. But the first time somebody ever sat down, because I asked to explain the gospel with me, Pastor Cliff Eckert of First Baptist Church in Bradford, Illinois, did something with John chapter 3 and verse 16 I'll talk about in just a bit. So let's look at John 3.16. Would you note with me? It's, it's, it's pretty simple. And it's, by the way, it's a great way to explain the gospel. If you say, I, I, I don't know how to explain the gospel to somebody. I encourage you to say, I, I want to know. Three are involved in this verse. There are two destinies in one decision. Let's look at the three that are involved, first of all. For God so loved the world. Let's, let's look at the passage and see what it has to say for us. That God so loved the world. Three are involved, God. Now, we probably take this for granted. It is amazing what people believe or don't believe about God. When you say the word God, I think we all here probably have a concept, a biblical concept of who God is and what he's like. But unfortunately, in our own land, I, a number of years ago, I was speaking at a vacation Bible school. And gave an invitation. Kids came. And one of the counselors dealt with the child. The child did not know. I mean, I'm talking United States of America. I mean, this is a number of years ago. Not now. This is in one of the suburbs. This is in Plymouth, Minnesota. 
in the suburb of the cities. He did not know what it was about. I was speaking in some evangelistic meetings in Normandale Baptist Church, which is Bloomington, Minnesota. And an invitation was given, and a young child responded. The personal worker talked to that child. I don't, I don't know why they came forward. Maybe in Bible school to get in a Kool-Aid line or something. I don't know what it was. But neither one of these children, I mean, we're talking over 30 years ago. I mean, we have problems today in comprehension of Scripture. Neither one of those children really knew about the gospel. They didn't know who God really was. What they did, maybe started with Adam and Eve, or explained then Christmas. You know what Christmas is about? You'd be surprised how many people don't know what Christmas is about. What I'm saying is, when it comes to knowing who God is, a lot of people don't have comprehensions. I have a friend, he's been probably in the mission field, England, probably going on 40 years plus. When he went over there when he was still in college in England, He's talking to a little child, or maybe, you know, one old enough to comprehend, and he started witnessing to this child. The child began to cry because this child thought my friend was swearing at him because when he heard the Lord's name, it was in vain. He thought this foreigner, well, the United States, is swearing at me. There are a lot of concepts about God, unfortunately, that are so foreign. In this day and age, you've heard of pantheism with a great influence of new age and days gone by. Pantheism said God is everything and everything's God. You, you say, well, I don't, uh, we don't believe that. Probably one of the biggest countries in the world now as far as population. I think if they have it, they just will soon overcome China. That's India. That's a concept of many of them. That God is everything. That's why you hear the term holy cow. You've heard of karma. If your karma's bad, you're going, probably going to come back as an earthworm in a heavily fished area. Okay? If your karma's good, you might come back in India as a cow. I taught there a, a few times. And right across the street in front of us in uh, uh, Bangalore, uh, one of the times you see ox carts, you see cows. They're doing good. Their concept is God is everything and everything's God. The first verse in the Bible shows that's not God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Everything that's created is other than God. But millions of people associate God with being in everything. More and more so as new age and so on has had its emphasis, God becomes mystical. What's God really like? Well, he's, uh, you know, he's maybe a feeling, he's a concept, he's some kind of an, an idea. And whatever God is to that person's God, as far as a lot of people are concerned. That's not who we're talking about here. For God so loved the world, we're not talking about God's everything and everything's God. We're not talking about the fact that he's some mystical concept. Or sometimes, and I, it's just so hard because some people can be calloused, sinners. Lifestyles are rotten. And then when it comes to the funeral, People do everything to say, well, he's with God the Father. And the concept, he's a, he's a grandfatherly type, and I'm a grandfather, so uh, I, I understand this. And you got a shirt right there, it says Grandpa on it there. You know that he's a grandfather type, and you could never do anything wrong enough not to come to heaven. Every single person on earth is wrong enough not to go to heaven. We're sinners. We're depraved sinners. So do we talk about the God of the Bible? What are we talking about? For God so loved the world, the God that exists is self-existent. He had no beginning and no end. In fact, that's what the name Jehovah, literally Yahweh. When Moses is getting ready to go back to deliver the children of Israel, he said, he didn't want to do it. But he said, who shall I tell him sent me? And he says in Exodus 3.14, I am that I am. What, you say, what's that? Because God is self-existent. That is the Hebrew verb to be, I exist. God is self-existent. Didn't have a beginning. Everything else came from God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So he's self-existent. He's powerful, obviously. He's holy. He's righteous. He's just. And there's no compromise in the character of God. Sometimes we get disappointed in a person. You say, okay, they're a believer and I really trust them, and then they disappoint you because they compromise their character. There is no compromise with God. He's totally consistent in his holiness and his love and his justice and his perfections and his grace. But this verse emphasizes something else about this great God. For God 
so loved the world. Now that's not all he is. Have you ever heard anybody say, a God of love would never send anybody to hell? You might say, if that were the case, you might be able to make me think that a little bit. God is not only love, he's holy, he's just, he's perfect, and he's totally consistent. He has perfect integrity in his character, in his actions with every person on planet Earth. So the first person is God in that which is emphasized about this holy, perfect God who is totally other than anybody else because he's holy. It means he's po totally pure. It means he's totally other than everything else. He's totally separate from anything else. This God that is so holy, this God is so loving, that's the first person, the second person. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The second person referred to in this verse is the Lord Jesus Christ. But between, that's the third, excuse me, God so loved, what? The world. We sung about Africa. We sung about Asia. All over the world, every tongue and every nation, God loved the world. Now when we talk about the world, uh, some of you from other states, you say, wow, there's great beauty out there. We used to live in Alaska, I pastored there. And we'd come home, on the peninsula where we lived from Anchorage, there were probably four or five glaciers, maybe six that we would see in the summer, and I just loved the blue ice of a glacier. Great. Some of you say, I'm from a different state. We were just in Colorado for a conference a while back, and coming over the mountains, I almost got tired of mountains, you know, and you go west of Denver, you just, you, you're always in mountains, mountains, but they're so beautiful. When we came back, we saw, well, the beauty of snow. As we went up in the elevation, I said, I wonder if we'll get up there. I said, nah, we did. And it was snowing. There. It's beautiful. In whatever state you're from, it has its own beauty. You say, Iowa? Yes, Iowa has its own beauty. Where is corn and bean fields like that? Anywhere else. And then either side, you get the Mississippi River, you get over the Missouri River. Every state's beautiful. Now, having said all that, he's not talking about places. He's talking about people. He's talking about us. God so loved the world. That's people on planet Earth. Well, Moses, Isaiah, Paul, Hitler, Khrushchev. Some of the most rotten people you know, God so loved the world. That's why Jesus Christ came to die. The reason Jesus Christ came to die is to be a sacrifice for sin. First is God, second's world, third is the Lord Jesus Christ. Why, why did the Lord Jesus Christ come? He's the expression of God's love. Literally translated, for God so loved the world in this manner. He shows it. God so, in this manner, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The purpose of Jesus Christ coming, we talked about Zacchaeus in Sunday school this morning. The Son of Man, in Luke 19.10, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So when we think about this great God who's holy and he's perfect, and we think about a world, a world of people who are rebels, who are sinners, all deserving God's judgment. The third person is the Lord Jesus Christ that came to take our place on the cross. His death, burial, and resurrection is our only hope. 1 John 4.10, one of my favorite words in the New Testament, you're going to think I'm weird, okay? One of my favorite words in the New Testament is propitiation. You say, you are weird. Uh, I, please don't ask me to spell it or even pronounce it. What, what does propitiation mean? Well, let me give it to you, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 10. Herein is love. Not that we love God. It didn't initiate from us. Adam and Eve in a perfect environment. So all the money we spend on perfect environment, forget it. I mean, I mean, it's okay to you know, conserve, conserve and so on. Adam and Eve are in a perfect environment. They walk personally with God in the evening. But Satan came along, tempted them, and said, God's holding out on you. God knows if you eat from that tree, you know the difference between good and evil. God doesn't know it by experience, but he knows it like a doctor does. You could talk to any doctor about the effects of a disease. He's never had the disease but he knows how ravishing it is to a person. Well, 
Adam and Eve thought, this is great. We'll know between God and good and evil. But unfortunately, they found out by experience, which came by disobeying God directly. So here it is love. Not that we love God, because we're sinners, the opposite of the character of a holy, perfect, and just God. Here it is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. For God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son. Here's love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Okay, what does propitiation mean? It means wrath being removed. The heathen would offer up, you know, fruit or animals or even human sacrifices to propitiate, to satisfy the wrath of a holy God or their gods. God's wrath, it says in John chapter 3, verse 36, 20 verses following this one. It says, we are under God's wrath if we've never trusted Jesus Christ as personal Savior. Everybody on planet Earth is under his wrath. So here in his love, not that we love God, but that he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. The thing that amazes me is God took the initiative to satisfy his own wrath on my behalf. Because I deserve God's wrath. I deserve it being poured out full force in all its white hot lava intensity. I deserve that. We all deserve that. We didn't love God. He loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation of our sins. He gave himself a reason for not judging us, for not showing his wrath to us. Have any of you ever heard of Paul Levine, evangelist Paul Levine, Bible track echoes? Anybody? Okay. Okay. One person has heard of Paul Levine. When I was in Bible college, Paul Levine came and illustrated what I want us to see about who God is in him satisfying his wrath on our behalf. He took three chairs. He put one here, he put one here, and one here. What does it mean that he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sin to remove wrath that we deserve? In God's love, John 3.16, God said, I love everybody on planet Earth. God's holiness agrees because God's holy love, but he said, everybody on earth is a sinner, and they deserve your judgment. And so consequently, because you're holy, you cannot allow them to come in and spend eternity in heaven. In the justice of God, this isn't something separate about God. This is the very character of God. He is love. He is holy. He is just. The justice of God it says not only can they come not come into heaven, they must be judged because they're sinners, and God is holy and He's perfect and is righteous, and those people need to be judged for their sin. Here in His love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, it says He, Christ. He, God, made him, Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God's holiness was satisfied because Jesus dying in our place on the cross is perfect. He died as our substitute. Somebody as our substitute is perfect, sinless, took our place on the cross. When he died on the cross, he cried out, My God! My God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's why I think the pastor was there yesterday. That's why I think Jesus prayed, if this cup can be taken from me, because he knew I'm going to experience. And I don't understand it. We'll never understand, don't think. I'm going to be, God's going to turn his back on me some way. God satisfied his justice on our behalf by punishing Jesus Christ for our sin. So herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. God, the world, Jesus Christ came because he took the punishment that we deserve for our sin. It goes quicker with the rest of it. So three are involved, God the Father, the world, and God the Son. But there are two destinies. Note the two destinies in John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish. You say, that, you know, sometimes that word bothers me, perish. What, what do you mean? You say, it sounds like annihilation. That's not the emphasis. You, a person in John three sixteen, 
when it says perish, it doesn't mean you lose your being, you're destroyed. It means you lose your well-being. You go to the lake of fire forever and ever and ever without any relief. You say, that sounds so cruel. No, it sounds holy and it sounds righteous and it sounds just because God made a provision for the whole world and they rejected God's provision. Man originally chose to sin against God. And now God made a provision. The second person of the Trinity became man and took our place in the cross. And if individuals reject that, it is totally just and righteous for God to send them an everlasting fire forever. You see, the word perish talks about you're ruined. The purpose of your being is destroyed. We're made in the image of God. And for eternity, a person experiences pure wrath and pure justice and pure holiness from God. I don't like that concept any more than you do. And God says in Ezekiel 33, 11, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But God, because he's God, because of who he is, must and will punish that which is totally opposite of his character when he's made provision for that to be totally different. That's why we send missionaries. That's why we're to witness to individuals to give that message to them. To perish means separation from God forever. But that's why God sent Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. You see, God sent his own son so people would not perish. That's one destiny. What's the other destiny? But have, what is it? Have what? Tell me. Everlasting life. Uh, there are two ways to look at that. When I, when I was younger, and I think probably after I became a believer, everlasting, I talked about the quantity. It's ever and ever and ever, and it never ends. And by the way, that's true. Uh, if you go to sleep tonight, you put your head down and say, I'm going to figure out what eternity is before I go to sleep, you're in trouble. Uh, because how can you possibly comprehend infinity as far as time is concerned. Never ending. And it is everlasting. There's no end to it. But it's just not a quantity. It's quality of life. In fact, Jesus Christ, in the same context, we said, no man takes my life from me. I lay it down. In that same context, Jesus talks about the fact if you go through him as a door, you have life and you have it more abundantly. Even now, on earth, in a sinful earth, we have abundant life. It's just not quantity. We're going to live forever and ever and ever. It's quality of life abundant. In the book of Revelation, it says, Blessed are they that die in the Lord. What's the word blessed mean? Well, that's how the Psalms begin. Blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but is delight and is in the law of the Lord. That person is blessed. The concept there that is used of blessed a basic idea is that person is to be envied because blessed is just a great state. It's just a blessed way to be. So when the book of Revelation says that blessed is those that die in the Lord. Let me ask you this. You ever been bored? Well, yeah. You say, you ever been unsatisfied? Uh, yeah. You ever feel unfulfilled? Yes. The word blessed erases all of that. You say, what's heaven going to be like? Because I don't know how to play a harp. You know, and sometimes people, you get the idea, you just sit around and play harps all the time and everything. It's not only new heavens, it's new earth. There's enough in the Bible to make us really curious and want to know more. But at the same time, it doesn't answer all of our, uh, you know, thoughts. But it does tell us it's blessed. You're never unsatisfied. You're never bored. You're never unfulfilled. What you're created to be in the Garden of Eden, in Adam and Eve, you will experience for eternity in the new heavens and the new earth. Period. You're, every day, I'm not even sure we sleep. We might. You know, the Bible says God never slumbers nor sleeps. Deacon came home one time and he couldn't toss, toss. His wife said, what's wrong? Well, there's a problem in the meeting. She says, is it true God never slumbers or sleeps? Yeah. She said, why don't you sleep? There's no use in both of you being awake. Well, you know what? God is eternal. We may not, but everything. And the Bible says in the book of Revelation, there's a tree of life that bears 12 manner of fruit, one every month. 
It says to me, maybe in our glorified bodies we may eat. You say, really? Remember when Jesus in Luke 24 talked? He said, you have something to eat in his glorified body? I don't know, but I'm telling you, if you go up to in one of the months and it's an apple, there are no worms. Okay? What I'm saying is, in eternity, everything is perfect. When Peter describes it, he talks in 1 Peter chapter 1, and in verse 3, he talks about the fact that we that are born again have a new hope. And there's a new inheritance for us, a new home. And, and it's uncorruptible, incorruptible, undefiled, and fades not away. Peter used three negative descriptions of heaven. It's incorruptible, it doesn't fade, it's not defiled. Now, let me illustrate that. You get a brand new truck or a brand new car, okay? Whoa, be into the child whose bicycle puts a little scrape in that thing, you know. Don't go into gravel roads for a while. Why? Because it throws rocks. Or if you do, you go really slow. You don't want any scrapes and you don't want any dents in that. You buy this new dress for Easter or a wedding or whatever it is. And that morning, the child probably has pajamas on or something because you don't want milk or grape juice on that new dress. But you, so you wear it for Easter Sunday. But you know what? Pretty soon that truck has scratches in it and it has a little dent or ding here. Hopefully the owner did it, not you. Uh, and, and then you, the dress, pretty soon it wears out and it's in the closet. And you don't, Can you tell me anything on earth that is right now, other than your eternal soul, that is incorruptible, it's undefiled, and it doesn't fade away? You say, no, nothing. Everything does except my soul and the word of God that goes on forever. You see... When the Bible says, blessed are those that die in the Lord, that's everlasting life. It's not only length forever, it's quality of life. It's blessed life. God the Father loved the world, so he sent his Son, so that we wouldn't perish, but we'd have everlasting life. But it all comes down to one decision. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. It all hinges, in a sense, from a human standpoint, on that one decision, that one point in life. Now, would you note, now hang on, because you're going to say, this is heresy. You're wrong. It's restrictive. You say, what? Yes. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him, what does Jesus say right after he said, in my father's house are many mansions, if we're not so I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And Thomas, he said, the way you know, and Thomas said, I don't know the way. And then he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. It's restricted. It's restricted to Jesus Christ's provision. God only made one provision. There aren't all kinds of roads to heaven. There are not many ways to heaven. There's only one way. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. When the apostle stood before religious authorities who had their own system down, he said, there's no other name given among men under heaven whereby you must be saved. That's in this day and age in which we live, the term postmodernism is kind of going out of fashion. It says, you know, there's no such thing as absolute truth. In fact, they say that's oppressive. They're saying, you're trying to force your idea upon somebody else, and that's a form of oppression. And so, whatever anybody believes is fine. Well, the Bible says it's not fine. Because John 3.16 is restricted to God's one provision of Jesus Christ himself. God's love the world that he gave his only begotten son. And it's restricted not only to Jesus Christ, it's restricted to our faith in him. You say, that's not much of a restriction. It's a provision for the whole world. And it's for by simple faith. If I just trust and depend on what Jesus Christ did, I don't depend on myself and my works and the good things I can do. I remember when I was in Bozeman, Montana, we sort of started the church up again. And there was an individual, I don't know how many times I met with him. His name is Rick Helmus. I, I hope he's saved now. I'd talk to him. And I'd share the gospel with him. And he said, I'm not good enough, and I, and I need to do things. It was like, it's dependent upon me. No, it's all dependent upon Jesus Christ. You've heard of Billy Sunday? 
you know, the evangelist, actually from Iowa, uh, from Nevada. Everybody says that's Nevada. No, it's Nevada, Iowa. Born there, was a famous ball player for the, hang on, Chicago White Stockings. Yes, that was the name, okay. He held the record for running bases for a long time. Be- got saved, became an evangelist. It said maybe a million people walked the sawdust trail because back then they built a tabernacle and they had sawdust in the floor to keep the dust down. One time it was with a tent and they were taking a tent down and uh, somebody came up to Billy Sunday and said, what must I do to be saved? And he said, it's too late. You said, I can't believe that because that's why they had meetings for people to get saved. He said, it's too late. Well, he wanted to emphasize something of that individual. Back then, he was about 1,900 years too late. Because everything that is necessary to be done for us to have everlasting life was accomplished when Jesus Christ died on the cross. What were his next to last words? It is finished. It's restricted to what Jesus Christ has done. And it's restricted to placing our faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. You say, that's not hard. No, it's so simple little children can trust Jesus Christ personally. Father, Son, the world, perish everlasting life. It's restricted to Jesus Christ and trust in him, but it's also all-inclusive. For God so loved the world that Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You say, you know what? I couldn't work enough. You're right, because God's holy and perfect. And I couldn't give enough. I couldn't do enough. Right. Jesus has done it all. So if we'll admit our sinful, hell-deserving condition and trust him in him only, we have everlasting life. What did Pastor Ecker share with me in his study that night? between an evening service and a singspiration. John 3.16, and I think with John 3.16, he came to that word, whosoever. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And that restrictive is to Christ and faith in him, but it's all inclusive because whosoever, he said, you can put your name in there. Whatever your name is. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever that's anybody, if you put your name in there, should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's why, if you only have one chance for a TV audience, I think people say, I'm going to stand in the end zone and I'm going to hold up John 3.16. Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And it comes to this, have you trusted God's only provision, but his abundant for whosoever. Have you trusted Jesus Christ as Savior? If not, this morning would be a great time for you to tell God right where you are, Lord, I know I'm a sinner, and I know Christ died for me, and I receive by faith. I trust Christ as my personal Savior. And if you have, let's share this with the world for whom the Lord Jesus Christ came. Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness, for your blessings. Lord, thank you. You loved us so much that you sent Jesus Christ that we might have our sins forgiven and that we might have eternity with you in the new heavens and the new earth. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Larry. Sing our closing hymn, number 552, verses 1, 2, and 3. I am thine, O Lord. Where the west died, draw 
coming near, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope and be well be lost in thine. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to the cross where the west died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious Before thy throne I span. When I kneel in prayer and with thee, my God, I commune as friend with friend. Near, 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 blessed Lord, to the cross where the west died. Draw me near. Blessed Lord, to thy precious living sign. Will you close us? Thank you for your good attention to the Word of God. If God's probed your heart, you say, I need to trust Christ, or I need to just live closer to the Lord, please don't put that off. If you say, I need to trust Christ, I would be glad, my wife and the lady would be glad, and there are men and women here would be glad to take you aside the Bible and show you how you can know Christ as personal Savior if you don't know him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love, your grace, your mercy. We thank you that you're holy and pure and righteous. Thank you for this ministry. We pray that you will continue to bless here. Bless Pastor John and his wife as they're in the land of the Bible. Uh, just encourage them and cause them just to be closer to you because of seeing places where you ministered. We pray for your blessing upon each one here. You know that which is needed most in their lives. And so bless them by meeting the greatest need they have. Cause us all to leave here rejoicing in you and thanking you because of who you are and what you've done for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.